So I'd like to have a conversation about how to look at doing control, but really looking at it with linear circuits as a, as a problem. And I think this is one of those interesting places because after all, linear circuits tend to be a really good prototype for thinking about differential equations. So it seems like a very natural way to ask some questions. And one of the more, more sort of basic sort of second order approach would be just taking a very simple uh, L, LRC circuit. And in fact, at its very core, this is just a voltage divider in Laplace, where the basically dividing across the C, and you basically get this transfer function here. Now, you can also kind of imagine, if I had a similar structure, but imagine I had a minus C, where all these quantities are positive. Of course, here the minus sign now says, oh yeah, it's a minus C. And if I looked at this transfer function, it would be giving me a one for one minus a couple quantities. Interesting to take a look at what these two th systems do and how they approach the system. So, here's the question, right? Now, we say, okay, well, how do I look at this? Well, one of the first things that's very important is to say, all right, now I've got all of these different parameters, but I know they're sort of core things, like what is a core tau, which is sort of the L times the C variable. I know that there's sort of this Q definition, which sort of tau over Q is RC, which is kind of the middle point, which kind of always kind of harkens back to what is the quality factor, the Q of the inductor, because inductors always have intrinsic sort of resistance and other issues about it. So that's where you get the Q to it. And so then the question becomes, all right, when I use these pieces, how do the definition look like? Well, this is not gonna be tau squared, tau over Q plus and a VN. This one's very similar except that notice the minus sign and the minus sign here. Well, one of the things that's very valuable to just in general is to try to take your systems and try to sort of simplify it to get as many of the parameters out so there's only the fundamental things that are important. So for example, tau just sort of normalizes the time constant. So let's now just pick a T1, which is now dimensionless time around some time constant. And what we find if we get sort of two interesting differential equations. And it's interesting because you can actually show that these two differential equations are in its linear form, equivalent to things like if you had a one degree of freedom inverted pendulum for what it looks like it's stable and unstable in an unstable steady state. And we'll actually see that there's a real direct connection there. Well, if I take a look at these, these structures, this is a second order system, um, right? This will be second order in V out, second order V out here. And what I'm going to get is then x uh, is then going to be x1 and x2, which is going to be v out over dv out dt. And what you say is, all right, so now imagine that this is dx d, dt1, and this gives me my state equation. I'm going to just have the x's all coming out, or at least really going, going to be one of the x's coming out. And then it's b u of t, which is just that single uh, v in variable into the structure. So now that I've created this, now I can notice if I look at the two cases, here is the A matrix and the B matrix that I could use. Actually, there's a whole bunch of B matrices I could use. I could use an identity, which would be also uh, acceptable in this case. I could use a minus identity for the unstable case. Because we kind of know that these two correspond to what I would expect of the inverted pendulum problem. But even if you think about it, we kind of intuitively know this, this structure is a stable structure typically. It may have real or complex roots from a circuit perspective. This circuit typically, because of the minus capacitance, you kind of go, hmm, that's probably may or may not be stable. What we find out is you say, well, let me look at this A matrix, look at this A matrix for those two systems and the resulting B. Well, if you actually look at the eigenvalues of the A matrix, which really does determine the dynamics and the stability, in the one case, I get something with two stable roots where the real part of the eigenvalue is going to be less than zero. In fact, it will always be, it'll definitely be complex uh, for the L LRC circuit, depending on certainly if Q is greater than, uh, if Q is greater than a half, you will definitely get that. No matter what happens, you're gonna get the real part going to be negative, and so you're in good shape. Whereas in the other case, I'm now going to have two eigenvalues, one that's positive, one that's negative, they will be real. This is sort of a typical saddle node type of approach where things will converge along one eigenvector, but things will then diverge across the other. 
And so you get this kind of um, dynamics there, but it is an unstable dynamics. And so let's say you're sitting at a system like this and you're saying, hmm, for some reason I have a negative capacitance. Where would that actually happen? Well, it might happen because I've got an amplifier that um, because of the feedback around it is kind of pushing back a negative capacitance or something like that. And you're kind of worried about this. Well, how would I control this? Well, one way to approach this is to take just a proportional control from the output back into, um, effectively back into the input. Maybe I'm going to have an actual input and I will do a, a linear summation of some sort. Um, sometimes you make this to be minus k, you make it plus k. Fair enough, let's just keep it as a single constant and see what happens in this case. Um, and in fact, it'll, the positive actually makes sense because we're actually getting a minus sign um, through, the, through the structure. But here's the thing. So now this feedback back is going to be k times effectively what is x1, right? What is v out, right? We defined x1 as v out in the, in the first place. So as a result, this is x. This is k times x1. Well, if I put this together, effectively this looks, I bring this term over here, that's where k1 will be, and so now this is now my resulting A matrix that I'm working with. Well, if you look at this particular matrix, you say, well, what values of k would work? Well, if k equals to 1, this term goes to 0, and then all of a sudden it turns out, okay, I get, you know, at least I get lambda equal to 0 and minus 1 over q. There is kind of an interesting problem, you know, there is an issue in terms of the dimensionality there when as soon as lambda goes to zero. But at least I know I would at least be marginally stable in that case. But if I make k bigger than one, now all of a sudden this becomes negative and I actually get a stable behavior. In fact, it's not hard to imagine to look at the stable case. This is minus one. So if I made k two, now I'm exactly looking at like the same sort of stable case that I started with before. And so this is a simple example of showing that I can stabilize a system of this sort. Um, and sometimes it's possible and sometimes it can't be. But I, it's interesting to look at this from a circuit perspective in a case where something might have been an unstable system and say, well, what would be the feedback I would use? Thinking about it as a linear control feedback system, we might be tempted to think about it as circuits, and that does give us some wonderful intuition, but it's wonderful to look at it in multiple perspectives.